welcome to the Ghosts of Parent Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 250 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 24 of A Feast for Crows, that's Circe 5. And as always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. Unless, of course, you have a buy me a coffee tier that includes spoilers, then we will spoil things for you. Regardless, we hope to provide you some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They will provide some additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter, which will be particularly useful to you if you're not reading along. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing all right. It's good to see you. You look refreshed. You look relaxed. Yeah. I had you a, look like I, you've been I on had vacation. A nice week off. <laughs> yes, I had, a, I had a week off. And I had a, I had a, I was able to relax because Jenny was at the wheel and yes. she did a terrific job. She I sure just did. listened to it today. I mean, well, I've listened to the first, you know, third of it. I, I've only had a week. So. <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite the episode you landed there. Well, like we were so, I don't know if you've gotten to the part where we've talked about how you would be so irked by how long we went. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I, I was already thinking it before you got to that. But yeah, <laughs> we I realize what my role is now. It is basically just to sort of get things moving along. Yes. With, with, without you, I tend to uh, go on a bit. Yes. And, and, and I think Jenny doesn't feel authorized to tell you to shush like I <laughs> Yes, would, right. Know. Yes. <laughs> That's 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 all we miss while I'm gone. So, uh, but you were talking about something that I really want to sort of like latch onto. What do you do in the notes that is different for me than for you? I wasn't oh. quite sure I was following. So in the summary, in the summary, when yeah. I'm writing our me, you, me, you, me, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. For your bits, I leave out contractions for the most part because you don't use contractions as often as I do, or at least as in, it sounds but an and. No, as in don't and can't and could not. Oh, I see. You, you, I say, at least it sounds more natural for you to say could not. I, I, huh. my American accent could not sounds so formal, but your British accent wow. already sounds formal. So, you yeah. know, <laughs> so yes. Oh, well, that's interesting. I, I, I didn't, okay, so that's what you were talking about. I'd never, I obviously, I'd never noticed you were doing that and. I'm yeah. going to keep an eye on it for now. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That, you learned something. I have a couple of stories from... So my, my, my trip was uh, to, to a lake up in the mountains. Yes. Which is, given how hot it is here, it's been, it was very good timing on getting away <laughs> to the mountains where it's a bit cooler. I'm sure. And I have a couple of interesting stories. Around the dock, where our house had a dock where you could put a boat, and we could swim there. There were fish, and these fish obviously were pretty habituated to humans because they kept biting us. What? And they weren't piranhas? They were just... Well, that's what we started to call them, but they weren't <laughs> actually piranhas. But I only got bitten twice. But get this, the first time was right on my nipple, which what? I didn't like one little bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my It obviously goodness. went, ooh, that looks different. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And the second... The second time, I have a mole in my armpit. I'm showing McKelly now, listeners, <laughs> which is, it kind of sticks out a little bit. And they obviously went, oh, raisin. And it bit this. Oh, like, ah, wow. Little... So anything that anything mm -hmm. that stands out on your skin, they're going to try. Yeah. 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 Hey, by so, the way, Simon is not shirtless. He was showing me his, sh <laughs> his shirt where underneath <laughs> would be the mole. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was very strange. I mean, certainly... My my plan for skinny dipping was cancelled. I'll tell you that for free. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. But I, I put together, in the week I was gone, I put together between 40 and 50 miles of wakeboarding. Wow. That's a lot of... You must have gotten pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have a single bad fall the All whole right. time. All right, good. I was worried about uh, you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I had a, I had a few tumbles, but nothing serious. All In right. fact, n none of us, none of us had any really bad falls. So, because last year I hurt myself on like day one, and I actually missed a couple of days. But, I recall so this. Yes, this was my this was my biggest wakeboarding week of all time, and it was a lot of fun. I tell you, awesome. But but I am getting a bit hefty, and I broke the pole that the rope attaches to. <laughs> the, the pole was like, I can't, I can't 
keep doing I, this. <laughs> I know, right? So technically it wasn't me wakeboarding when that happened, but I think it happened when I wakeboarded and we didn't notice until the next person went is what I'm <laughs> suspecting because I was by a good 30 pounds, the heaviest person wakeboarding. So Well, you're not that heavy, so you must have been with some pretty skinny folk. Get up there. Yeah, my, my friend Tim, who owns the boat, is a, is a very uh, small fella. Okay. So he, he's quite a bit lighter than me, yeah. Okay. And then the ladies, much lighter than me. But what? yeah, so we broke the pole and we had to spend a whole morning sort of heads down in the boat trying to fix this pole, <laughs> which was, it was quite the operation. My friend Tim is is a heck of an engineer because he, he we fixed it, but I was like when I saw it, I was like, "There's nothing we can do." You're here. like, uh, "Do you need any notes written up about this?" <laughs> I, I know. I was exactly. I I was. I just stood with him in the sun while he, and it was incredibly difficult because he had to he had to put his head down into the guts of the boat, lying on his back, sort of with his feet up in the air, and then he had to undo wrenches above his own head. <laughs> I don't know how he did. I don't know how you would turn the wrench the right way. I mean, I'd be so confused about which way to turn the wrench at that point. I don't know how you get he back was... out of that position. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you basically had to pull him by the feet to get him back out of there. Yeah. But yeah, so so that was the and of the fourteen of us who went, six came home with COVID. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that but is uh, yeah. No, nobody in our house. Well, that's fortuitous. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> works we, out well tested. for you all. <laughs> yeah, we've tested. We've we've been isolating in case, but we none of us none of us caught it. It is possible. I I don't know how long it shows up as a test because Lucas was the very first person to get sick, but he's always tested negative. But it felt like he was patient zero, but then uh, he didn't have COVID. I mean, hmm. I assume a week later you would still test positive. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe it was him. Well. But then you'd think me and Carson would get it. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody mends quickly and successfully. Yes, I, I, I believe everyone feels a bit rough, but they're uh, they're okay. Well, how was your week while I was gone? I may have an addiction. Okay. I, I think I may have it, watched. Is it to podcasting? Is it to <laughs> yes, having... it's a podcasting addiction. <laughs> I may have watched. Just about every event in the Olympics so far, <laughs> at least almost every <laughs> final. I have it on in my on the TV in my office, and it is. I'm I'm watching it nonstop. I, you know, of course, I hit the swim quite hard as uh, I have a yeah solid connection to. I, swim. I haven't seen a single second of swimming, but uh, oh, I it understand. Was fantastic. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. But and Molly loves Tori Husk, and Tori Husk had a great. Uh, Olympics and anyway um then you know of course I watched the track in the field and volleyball and all the all the you know those big I, I haven't seen like a that. single second of track and field which I love to my oh, regret that's been I've great I've been too. very busy since I got back so I haven't been able to watch anything but I've watched archery skeet shooting I've rowing. seen archery <laughs> there you go I've seen I'm, rowing I'm, I'm fascinated by it I, I watched whitewater rafting and rock climbing today the men's vol U.S. men's volleyball was on is it, it my uh, streaming service gives me like four screens, you know, that yes, are on yes, at yes, the I've same time. It, yeah. That the men's volleyball quarterfinals or semifinals or whatever it was was on, but on the other one was skateboarding, and I was more riveted to the skateboarding <laughs> than the <laughs> volleyball. I just was, I was kind of fascinated. But you know, the one that, like, no joke, I was standing, my heart was pounding, and I had absolutely no idea what was happening. Was you get a guess? Give it a guess. I, I've got a, a, a well. You you changed my guess by that last sentence there. I was going to say badminton, but you did know what was happening with badminton, so it's not right. badminton. Yes. The, there's a guess for fencing. Ding ding ding! Fencing yeah. exactly. The women, yeah. the U.S. women, won gold over. I think it was Italy, and uh, I watched the the women and the men at different times, but. Uh, those little foils that they have were flashing left and right, and then all of a sudden one of them would cheer. Sometimes oh, both, both of them, of them would cheer. cheer. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's I what have I no found. idea both why. Cheer. <laughs> exactly. I, I had no idea why it's either like, of them. Both was of them cheering. would cheer. The point would go to one of them, and the other one would say, "Well, mine's clearly not working because I definitely won that point." Yeah, it, it 
fencing is genuinely mystifying. Yes. It feels to me like if they both hit each other, that shouldn't score a point. I don't care who hit first. Right. This is yeah. swords. If you get hit by the sword, it doesn't matter if it was second. That is a fair point. Yes. <laughs> you've got to, you, yeah, you've got to hit and not get hit back. I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I was super excited watching it, but all I could really do was watch the scores, you know, because I had no idea why they were scoring, how they were scoring, or anything. I, I watched the, the sport. Well, that's probably not true. I, I've watched a chunk of uh, judo, which is equally mystifying. Uh huh. Right. Yes. No idea what's going on. None at all. And then they start issuing yellow cards, and I don't know what that's about. It's really strange. Yeah. But I'm having a good time with it. I, you know, my thought is these people train their whole lives for these two weeks. Know, Sometimes right? it's one event, one race, one event. I, at least I can do is watch it and be amazed at their I, uh, athleticism. Yeah, I've watched almost none of it. It's kind oh. of weird. The volleyball is terrific, though. I love the volleyball. I watched some of the equestrian. I've watched only weird things. I, I saw a little bit of gymnastics. Yeah, I watched yeah, that Yeah, the yesterday. three-day eventing. With the yeah. dressage and then the cross country and then the show jumping. Yes, yes. It's all such weird stuff. <laughs> it is. I, I miss, I think modern pentathlon has dropped out. I've... Modern pentathlon. Yeah, was I've not heard horse of Horse racing, one. shooting, fencing. It was all kinds of weird things. <laughs> that sounds fun. It was very militaristic. Everything was yeah. militaristic in it. <laughs> that sounds pretty fun, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, that was, a, that was a sport right there. You should have to all do right. it all at once. Yeah. yeah, fence on horseback <laughs> while shooting. <laughs> we also watched the clay pigeon shooting, and it, yeah, there did yeah. appear to be seats at the far end of that. <laughs> <laughs> you better trust those marksmen. <laughs> Cheapest seats in the house, right there. <laughs> anyway, let's get down to business. How did we leave Cersei Lannister? Last we saw of Cersei, she was being presented with heads that never belonged to her brother Tyrion. <laughs> Meeting with her new small council, let's go quickly through them, Harris Swift, whose father-in-law to Kevin Lannister would be the new Hand of the King, Orton Merriweather that would be the Judicar, Orain Waters as the Grand Admiral, Kyburn taking Varys's role, and Grand Master Pycelle remaining, but not very happy. Nope. They've decided to send Balan Swan with the Mountain's Skull to Dawn. The Mandalays have imprisoned Davos Seaworth, who came as an envoy from Stannis. Cersei expects death to prove the Mandalays loyalty. The small council plan to rebuild the royal fleet, to not intervene in the Vale, where the Lord's Declarant are opposing P Peter Baelish, as you and uh, Jenny discussed in excellent detail last week. Well, thank you. Um, Cersei's only demand is that no harm f befall Littlefinger himself. The Night's Watch have chosen sides by giving lands and castles to Stannis, and Cersei was hatching a plan to have Osney Kettleback caught in flagrante delicto oh, with wow. Marjorie, uh, red-handed, but literally in the act of okay. perpetrating the crime. All right. uh, I like it. Osney then to be banished to the wall, where he would then murder Jon Snow. I mean, this is a twofer deal for Cersei. Yes. Uh, and then be pardoned to get a lordship and to become Cersei's concubine. He's in for all of that. Yes. Um, Tayana Merriweather is to take the news of the secret admirer to Marjorie. That's where we left her. Okay. Why don't we give the summary of this one? All right. And if you thought that recap was long, where do you get well, a load of this you. summary? <laughs> this is... I was, I was last night. I was working on the document, and McKelly was working on the document too. And I could see the summary taking shape. And as I saw it, I was like, "It's quite a big summary. Where, where's he at?" And I was like, "Oh, good. He's about a third of the way through the chapter." Yes. Like, <laughs> oh, these Cersei chapters a, are packed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. As I wrote that summary, I sympathized because I was like, "Well, a lot went on in the last Cersei chapter." Yes. And this one too. Well, so here we go. So King Tommen wants to sit the Iron Throne. It is his, after all. But his mother, Queen Cersei, wants to know where he got that notion from. Tommen says no one. But Cersei knows the source, and the king finally admits the truth. It was Lady Marjorie. Notice I said Lady, because the young king knows better than to use Marjorie's other title in front of his mother. Cersei also correctly surmises that Marjorie thinks that Tommen should be sitting in on the small council meetings as well. 
Cersei tells her son it'll all come in good time, but for now he's too young. To herself, she thinks that the boy can wait just like she had to. And if Marjorie thinks she's going to cheat Cersei of her rule, she's got another think coming. After sending Tommen away, the Queen meets with the Merchant Guild, where they express their concern over the growing sparrow issue in the city, and I don't mean little birds. Cersei says the new High Septon will need to address the issue, or else she'll settle it with the gold cloaks. Grand Maester Pycelle interrupts the meeting with urgent news from the North. Lord Wyman, Lord Wyman Manderley has followed through on her demands. He beheaded Davis Seaworth. Let me repeat that. He beheaded Davis Seaworth, who was in White Harbor on behalf of Stannis. As proof, the Freys have confirmed that the man's head and his distinguishable hands are on display. I'm heartbroken. Me too. Cersei is pleased and will send Wyman's heir back to White Harbor immediately. Cersei feels the North is falling into place. With White Harbor loyal to her and the Boltons rooting the Ironborn out, the majority of Northern houses should bend the knee. News from the South isn't as rosy. Lord Mace Tyrell is doing what he does best, sitting on his butt outside of Storm's End, uselessly firing rocks into the castle walls. Next up in Cersei's CEO day is Noho Dementis an envoy of the Iron Bank. He wants the Crown's payment on their debt, but Cersei stands firm that they will get their money after the rebellion has been squashed. Demetis tries to argue, but Cersei has him seen out abruptly. She then retreats to her chambers to prepare for dinner guests, escorted by Sir Osmond Kettleblack. She asks Osmond how his younger brother Osney is progressing in wooing and betting Marjorie Tyrell. The going is slow. The filly as they nickname Marjorie, likes him well enough, but they're never alone. If it's not Tommen or her cousins, it's the knights around the court. Cersei's intrigued by the men and asks for names. Sir Tallard, the Red Wine Twins, and Jalabar Joe, for starters, along with singers, fools, and jugglers. Cersei wants Osmond to assure Osney she'll find a way for him to mount the filly soon. As the pair walk, a wild cheer goes up across the yard. A squire has had a successful run at the Quintain. A small matter, but the cheer sounded like he'd won a tourney. It's then that she realizes that the squire in question is actually the young king. As Cersei approaches, the laughter and cheers turn to an uncomfortable silence. Tommen asks if she saw, and she praises his effort by saying that someday he'll rule the lists like his father had. Now Marjorie is unfamiliar with King Robert's conquests in jousting and presses Cersei for examples of his greatness. Cersei realises she's made a bit of a mistake. It was Jamie she had in mind. Thinking fast, Cersei replies that Robert won the tourney of the trident besting Rhaegar Targaryen. Before the young queen can follow up, Cersei asks for a private word with Loras Tyrell. Cersei asks about his role in Tommen's jousting exhibition. It was Marjorie's idea. He merely gave the king some instructions. As there's no master at arms in the Red Keep, he feels the need to guide the boy. He should be a squire at this age. Cersei thinks the Knight of Flowers is not the sort of man that any boy should emulate. She tells Loras she'll appoint a master at arms post haste. As Cersei continues her walk to her apartments, she considers the right master at arms and decides that another Dornishman would suit, thinking of the bad blood between Sunspear and Highgarden. Newly minted Lord Kyburn awaits in her solar for a news roundup. More squabbling between Mia, Lys, and Terosh. Boring. Slave revolt in Meereen. Who cares? In Dawn, Sir Damon Sand has been arrested by Prince Doran Martell for demanding the Sand Snakes be freed. Also, the daughter of the Knight of Spotswood has been suddenly married to the elderly Lord Estamont. Also, as he thinks of this, is a memory of being impregnated with Joffrey in Greenstone, the seat of House Estamont, by the father of Joffrey, who was a fantastic jouster. <laughs> A story of a popular puppet show in the city about lions who devour their enemies amuses Cersei. That is, until it ends with a dragon hatching and eating the lions. She wants names of any highborn in attendance and wants the puppeteer's heads. Kyburn asks to keep a female puppeteer for his experiments. It seems Sinel is exhausted. Cersei agrees, shuddering at the thought of Sinel's fate. 
Her well-earned relaxing bath is interrupted when Jamie and Tommen burst in. Tommen wants to start practising jousting daily and wants Loras to train him. Jamie, unhelpfully, signs off on the idea. Cersei shoots it down. Tommen says Marjorie told him that everyone has to do whatever the king says. Cersei calls her son forward and reminds him he's a little boy. She will rule until he comes of age. He settles for the prospect of a new kitten, but announces that someday he'll outlaw beetroot. When alone, Jamie asks if she's drunk or just stupid. In lieu of his face, Cersei slaps the water. Jamie says Loras is the best jouster around. Cersei knows what Loras is and doesn't want him around her son. Cersei sends her brother away and decides she must be rid of him soon. He's more hindrance than help. Cersei dresses for dinner, wishing she was supping with Tayana Merriweather instead of Lady Felice Stokeworth and her husband Sir Balman Birch. They talk of Tanda's broken hip from a riding accident and drink heavily. Their trip to King's Landing was unpleasant due to unsavoury men calling themselves sparrows and the lack of hospitality from Lord Giles Rosby's ward when they stopped to spend the night. Cersei tells of how Septon Olidor had nearly won the votes to become High Septon when the sparrows dragged him from a brothel. Now it's Septon Lucian who leads in the votes. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. The link to our page is in the show notes. Eventually, Lady Lolly's son Tyrion comes up. The pair apologize for his unfortunate name. Cersei says the name isn't the problem. Then her voice breaks as she tells of her constant fear for her son's life. With Tyrion out there plotting the boy's death, she means her brother, not the newborn baby. Yes. After a Mummer of the Year performance by the Queen, complete with tears and shaking hands and platitudes heaped on her guests, she asks that they off Sir Bronn before he builds a secret army for Tyrion. Sir Balman agrees, and the Queen is overflowing with false gratitude. Wait, you think she was faking? Wow, <laughs> I didn't see that. Uh, before retiring to her bed, she looks in on Tom, and he's fast asleep with three black kittens curled up around him, gifts from his lady wife. Cersei sees the gifts as an attempt at seduction by Marjorie. She recalls how Rhaegar's daughter once had a black kitten. The girl should have been Cersei's daughter if plans had gone as intended. She remembers how in love she was with Prince Rhaegar. Her father told her she'd marry him when the time was right. And when Cersei turned ten, Tywin hosted the king and his son at Casterly Rock. At the end of the tourney held in the king's honor, it was to be announced that Cersei and Rhaegar were betrothed. However, when the tourney had come and gone, no announcement was made. Her aunt Gemma told her that the king had rejected Tywin's proposal. From that time on, Maggie the Frog's prophecies had taken root in Cersei's mind. If she'd married Rhaegar, Robert's rebellion would never have happened. The prince would not have looked twice at the wolf girl. She'd never forgiven Robert for killing Rhaegar on the trident. But the lions do not forgive easily. A lesson Sabran would soon learn. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in to today's episode. <laughs> <laughs> no time for analysis. That's right. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a big one. Yes. Uh, I will say just 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 focusing on one part. I know you like to go sort of chronologically, but I always like to f- sort of focus on one part. When you hatch plans with drunks, it doesn't <laughs> usually go well. Like, yes. That's, that's right. my thing. Did Did you watch the White House Plumbers thing? With I remember Woody it. Harrelson. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that basically Nixon would have got away with it if he just hired people who weren't mad as hatters. They were <laughs> lunatics. You know. Yes. Yeah. Cersei doesn't. Yeah. You know, we've talked about it bit before. She She doesn't mix with the highest caliber of company. She mixes with no. whoever's willing to agree yeah. with her for the. I guess part. I guess that is the problem. The, the the higher the caliber, the less likely they are to be drooling yes men. You know. Right. Yes, and she does not like people who are she, not drooling yeah. yes men. But you know, as 
Speaking of chronolo- chronology, going chronologically, however I want to say it, the very first uh, scene when Tommen wants to sit the Iron Throne and Cersei says, no, you're not going to do that. And she said, and, and they're arguing a little bit, and she says, do you want me to call Pate and have him beat or whipped until he bleeds? And uh, it's we discover that this boy named Pate is the whipping boy for Tommen, which is not so bad because Tommen is a sweet boy with a soul and and apparent seemingly a good helping hand of a a good amount of empathy. However, the next sentence is that he was also Joffrey's. So I'm surprised the boy still lives. <laughs> but, yes, but here's your mistake. You think that Joffrey got whipped very often for his crimes. You're you're thinking how often Joffrey should have been. Whipped. <laughs> That's true. Good <laughs> distinction. Good distinction. Although I hey, can see it was probably like I'm fine. <laughs> I could see Joffrey making a you know, a game out of seeing how badly he can get this boy whipped. Well, that's true. That's true. Tommen, Tommen, the threat to Tommen was enough to stop him. Yes. Yeah. Joffrey would Maybe be because like, Pate is all stunted and broken. You know, the last thing Maybe. you want to do is see that poor child. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. I, I wouldn't want to be Joffrey's whipping boy. I'm afraid he would take that very literally and think, this is the boy that I have to whip. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm going to go straight in with a big claim here, right? Yeah. Okay. Cersei comes out here and admits basically to us that she's in it for the rule. Uh-huh. I mean, she she doesn't not want Tommen on the throne because he's a little boy who should be doing little boy things. She wants her time to shine. Right. That's why she's here. Now, right. would she kill Tommen? Now, we've said several times on this podcast, and I still believe it, that she loves her children. But she does have a little bit of trouble with impulse control, particularly with things that thwart her heart's desire. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Is Tommen safe from her? I think yes. I mean, that's my first reaction is yes, because I do think she loves her children, but I see your, I see your argument. I see, I see where you're coming from. And it's a fascinating idea. I had not considered before fascinating in a terrible way. Yeah, but uh, yeah. yeah, still a fascinating thought. Uh, I would um, now. She, we've discussed this before in the episode where um, her father, uh, his wake, I and mean, she thinking to herself, "All he'll be remembered in a hundred years is being Cersei Lannister's father." Right, right. She doesn't have a whole lot of time before Tommen right. comes of age. So okay, so I've gone to the extreme. Let's let's dial it back a little bit. Would she squire him out in Essos oh. for twenty years? <laughs> right. Got to you. Got to change your name, change his look, and everything. Uh-huh. <laughs> would you? Would you like? You know? Would she usurp his throne? I think she would do that. And once think... you usurp someone's throne, that can lead to bloodshed, no matter how close you are. Yeah, I could see. I could see her finding a way to extend her rule as long as possible. While while we're on the subject of machinations, can I chip in on last week's episode? Certainly. Do you think Peter Baelish really did arrange that with Lynn Corbray, or do you think he's claiming it after the fact? Oh wow, uh, I I thought he arra- prearranged it, but I had not. That's what he said it. he did. Yeah, you I know had... Peter Baelish, right? I thought you were gonna mention about uh, the Marillion being shuttled into. Um, <laughs> Robert's room at night to whisper, sing, sing to quietly him. enough that only he can hear. You. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you see the Lynn Corbury thing. It was it. Well, I don't know Lynn Corbury's character, so I don't know how out of character it was. It was inappropriate for sure. Right. But he's he's martial and was pushed to anger, and maybe it was just his reaction. And Peter Baelish, after the fact, went, "Well, wouldn't it seem like I was really in control of things if I <laughs> right. said?" <laughs> Who's gonna haul him up on that? <laughs> yeah. How, how much did his neck prickle when that sword came out? <laughs> <laughs> huh. Well, yeah, I hadn't thought about you that see? angle. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You see, you missed me. You missed I, me. That's would right. Have been half the length, and it would have had that one inch extra point that you did, you two didn't make. All true. Um, 
I will say, I think Marjorie is uh, Marjorie's just a great character. She yeah. she is working her machinations constantly, uh, but she needs Tommen to be just a little bit stouter. He is, uh, he is a child and he can't stand up to his mother, but her machinations can only go so far if he crumbles in her presence. Yes, that definitely would help a bit. That in that in that way, her being married to Joffrey would have. Uh been more beneficial because That's he true. didn't fold to anyone but yeah mm. i mean as if cersei doesn't already have enough distaste for marjorie now she's filling tommen's head with ideas of ruling sitting the iron throne sitting in on small council meetings which is really something that cersei's not going to to take yeah well. and and cersei's perspective on that would be you know if he i mean he is the king and he could claim his right to the throne early and then dispatch Cersei back to Castle Rock or whatever. Right. But if he is only nine, ten years old when he does that, then Marjorie becomes the new Cersei. She oh. actually runs the... That's how Cersei will perceive it. Yes. Yes. I like that. I like that thought. Yeah. I mean, in reality, there's no real harm in him attending small council meetings or sitting right. on the Iron Throne, except for the chance of physical harm sitting on the iron throne (laughs) but i think the main reason she doesn't want it want him sitting in i mean chances are he sits in on maybe two small council meetings realizes how boring it is and is like no i want to go play with my kittens don't make me do that again but she doesn't want a higher authority in the room with her that would remind her that she's only the regent she is not the monarch yeah good point and uh She's got that I waited, he can wait mentality. Yep. So news from the city is that the sparrows are giving the merchants concerns, um, possibly the whole city, because there's a lot of them and they are they are clearly puritanical in their religious beliefs. For right. example, dragging the poor, innocent pretender to the High Septon's throne from the brothel seems very unfair. You know? <laughs> He's you a man know? of God. It's funny you mention that because, uh, so yeah, he was the leading contender to be the next High Septon, and they dragged him out of a brothel, as you just mentioned. Well, now uh, Lucian is the front runner, and and according to Cersei, only a few votes shy. Well, last Cersei chapter, I mentioned that Lucian's name that you don't use anymore when you become a Septon, but Lucian's surname is Frey. And so ah. does that mean that he is not above foul play? May he have tipped off the sparrows to where Oliver Olador might be at that time? Good point. Plus, can I just say, George Martin, you could have called him Walder and that would have made it a lot easier for us to follow <laughs> that thread. Just... <laughs> True. <laughs> Lucian? Come on. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, the, the sparrows are a bit of an... Uh, they're becoming a growing issue. I mean... You know, the past few chapters, yeah. we see this growing concern. And uh, on top of that, she has decided not only is the Iron Bank not getting any money from the crown, neither is the faith. So might the the lack of funds going toward the faith be a spark that lights the sparrow fire and takes it to some dangerous level or so? We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsharenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. Yep. So Grandmaster Pycelle was pretty querulous at the last small council meeting. He is not any happier now, it would appear. He... I think the biggest single thing for him is Kyburn. I think he thinks that a defrocked maester is the last person that should be invited to the small council. Absolutely, yeah. We discussed last time that he's also likely frustrated by the second-rate council that Cersei has yeah. uh, put together yeah. and the questionable yeah. advice Gi- that they give. Given who he served with, he has served with uh, the John Arryns of this world, the right. Tywin Lannisters, Barristan the Selmys. Stannis, Bar- yeah, Stannis Baratheons, and yes. now he's serving with uh, Wanahakalugi. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I've forgotten whose name is. <laughs> Harris Swift for one. Har- Lorraine Waters. Yeah, Harris, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, and you're right. I think his biggest issue is Kyburn. I don't think he's threatened for his own position by Kyburn because the Citadel appoints the Grand Maester and right. they're not going to appoint a defrocked Maester, as you said so eloquently. Um, but I think I think that Kyburn is like the example of just how far this small council right. has fallen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the news about Davos, obviously it's heartbreaking if it's true, but can it be true? I mean, George Martin is pretty brutal to us readers, but even for him... To take one of our beloved characters and just to slaughter him off stage. Off stage. And present his head. Exactly. Yes, right. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm tempted to leaf ahead to look for a Davos chapter to see if he's still <laughs> amongst us. But I, 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 I shan't spoil. But right. uh, if he... All right. Let's assume then it isn't true because even George Martin wouldn't do that to us. What are the Mandalays therefore up to? Are they plotting something with Stannis? to pretend to be on the Lannister side? Uh, yeah. That's I, a good question. To, yeah, if, yeah. If it's not true, then they're up to something. But, but here's the thing about it not being true. They could have faked anyone's hand. You know, the, the telltale yeah. thing was the hands, the, you know, because the small he's... small hand, yeah. Yes. Um, but the phrase signed off on it you know, the Freys apparently are in White Harbor and have said, yes, we've seen it. It's legit. Uh, and, you know, the phrase confirming adds legitimacy because, yeah, okay, so the Manderleys, so Wyman Manderley might be plotting something, but we know the Freys are, after the Red Wedding, they are in bed with the with the Lannisters all the way. So, but the but the phrase wouldn't necessarily know Davos, right? Well, that's true too. Yeah. That's so true. I wonder if I'm I'm imagining in the sort of like the the uh, stable yard of White Harbor, it'd be like, "Hey, hands up, anyone who's missing their fingers." <laughs> yeah, you come here. <laughs> we could need you... you for a special task. <laughs> Before you cut the hands off, you could also just cut the fingers off. You know. Well, that's true. If, if to, but I think the phrase would be smart enough to notice the blood spurted out of the fingers as well as the wrist. <laughs> true, true, true. Yeah. Uh, but all right. So if it is true, is is her assessment of what's going on in the north correct? The White Harbor is for her. The Ironborn are being routed by the Boltons. Yeah, I think she is right. The north is falling into place. Maybe not as quickly or as easily as her throw away one sentence thought about it but yeah it's it's heading in the right direction for her. right for the lannisters definitely for victorian right. and asha uh it puts the plans that they proposed in quite je- uh, quite a lot of yeah, yeah doubt yeah. uh you know it's unlikely that they're going to hang on to the north as victorian campaigned if things are playing out the way cersei thinks and yeah. if, if the boltons get a foothold and start recapturing castles why would anybody bother negotiating with Asha for, uh, you know, the land that she was hoping But they lost to get? anyway, right? They did, yes. Yeah, so okay, then, fine. Their plans Doesn't just would have been in it, jeopardy had they much won. Much more difficult. Yes, 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 yes. I see what you're saying. Uh, so Mace Tyrell is pretty useless. We kind of knew this. Uh, <laughs> gotta say, though, I mean, I, there's not much you can do at Storm's End. He's already tried once for years and right. made no so so why even agree to this why stick around also why not try to expedite things you must realize you've been got rid of so that the lannisters can re-establish primacy over the tyrells which means his son and daughter are in danger yeah i wonder if he's thinking about it that way or if he's thinking that he's been assigned this very important task of keeping Stannis' mm. troops bottled up. This in is my end. favorite picnic spot in the whole of the Seven <laughs> right. Kingdoms. He, 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 got, he got under the, t- the tree that he loved being under so much last time and <laughs> just felt like old times. <laughs> I, I just feel that it would serve his family well if he were to tie up loose storm ends. Ah, <laughs> yes, yeah, I saw yeah. that in the notes. Well done. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, he's he's keeping Stannis' force in the castle castle but i'm not sure that that is really uh, right it's not like something they were going to be doing soon was running you know coming out of the castle to attack with stannis yeah, yeah. stuck in the north 
a little exercise in front of the castle, maybe, but otherwise they were going to stay there anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yes. Are you worried about the way that Cersei treated the Iron Bank? It feels like. Uh-huh. Yeah. It feels like when you become the most powerful bank on the planet, you didn't get there by letting people default on their loans, no matter right. how powerful those people are. Right. Yes. I, I, I will say I got to give her a little bit of props to for sticking to her guns, even if naively so. But yes, as you say, I can't see the Iron Bank rolling over and giving up and hit, uh, him just going home, you know, back to Bravos and being like, well, I tried. They, she said yeah. no. <laughs> she said no. <laughs> so what are we going to do? <laughs> Question for you. Do you feel like Marjorie is intentionally avoiding alone time with Osney? She obviously likes him and he's obviously kind of like charming. So given two attractive, charming people, you can imagine them enjoying each other's company. But he's complaining that he never gets alone time with her. Do you think she is protecting herself by ensuring that there is no such alone time? It is so hard to tell with Marjorie because she acts so naive and sweet and innocent. But you get the feeling that there is a lot going on in that brain of hers behind the scenes. Right. I'll refer you back to the moment where uh, Cersei accidentally says that uh, Tommen's <laughs> father was good at jousting. Marjorie <laughs> yes. didn't come across as a sweet, innocent airhead then. She was like, wait now, do tell. Right. That. Yeah, so do you think, you do think that she knew what she was doing, right? That she wasn't genuinely saying, oh, I, I didn't realize Robert was such a good oh, jester. Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't think that for one second. Marjorie was like, oh, lady, you finally spilled the beans. I yeah. am going to press this issue. Yeah. Uh, um, but, but she also gets, Cersei also gets very excited about the idea of all these men being around Marjorie. And a similar question is, why is she so excited about this? Uh, I I don't know if this is a spoiler because I don't remember anything, but um, my guess would be if she gets caught with one of them, then the presence of more uh-huh. men yes. that spent time with her adds to that. I think it's very much the way uh, Anne Boleyn was treated by Henry VIII. Uh, basically, she had lots of male admirers who were always around and every one of them got accused of having an affair with her and turned on each other and pointed the finger at each other. And right. her guilt was then assured by them admitting to it, basically, which was yes. all lies, of course. But Yes, I think, I think you're exactly right. Either to find someone else that Marjorie likes better or ruin her reputation, even if no one is found to have exactly. actually... Yeah. Yeah. been uh intimate with marjorie just the presence of all these men uh give her an opportunity to say she's been unfaithful yeah. to tom and so so because of because of how she acted in the conversation about the jousting and uh, Tommen's father i think she's smart enough to see the danger and to sort of avoid it however the danger is so overwhelming here because cersei is determined to make this stick no matter what there's no way to avoid a blatant lie against right. you you know yeah um and she ends the that that bit of the conversation by saying tell sir osney i'll find a way for you for him to mount the filly soon how's how's she gonna do that, is that is, uh, how is she guaranteeing that is there some sort of trick coming has she got a love potion being worked up or something i mean the the other person i think of in this is tana merriweather because uh when Cersei hatched this plan. She sent Tana Merriweather to sort of lay the groundwork for it. Say, oh, you've got a secret admirer. And then don't let it out immediately, but eventually let it out that it's Osney Kettleblack. Um, Tana, we don't know what her loyal where her loyalties lie. She's acting very loyal to Cersei. She's convinced Cersei. Right. But she might have said to Marjorie, This guy's coming for you. Do not be left alone in a room with him. Could be. Yeah. I mean, we know she's a social climber. It depends on which queen she feels, you know, (laughs) has the the better odds of. uh... Or she isn't a social climber. She is purely a Tyrell plant 
told yes. to do whatever it takes to yes, get into Cersei's right. good books, but be working for the Tyrells. And that's where you pay the Tyrells back with that little piece of information. You know? Yeah, she's in King's Landing because she was one of Marjorie's women in, of, co- of her court. So, but anyway, I'll say that despite Robert not being much of a jouster, our Marjorie is. She, <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> she can joust this one. <laughs> Uh, I will say, very rarely is anything predictable in this book. It's hard to see where things will go. You know, George Martin has a, a vast imagination and comes up with new things. But Cersei's response to Tommen uh, riding against the Quintain was entirely predictable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As soon as she heard that <laughs> cheer, she knew she was going to have to break bad on someone because uh-huh. that cheer was too loud for an ordinary squire. <laughs> But actually, coming back to my idea about killing him, she might want to encourage risky behavior. Right. <laughs> Have you tried it without armor? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quintain? Come on! <laughs> Your father! Try him! Wait, no, he's dead, sorry. Uh, so, another question for you. Part of Cersei's reasoning for not letting Loras instruct Tommen, did you determine that that was a homophobic reason? It... <laughs> I think there's definitely an undertone of that. I also think there's the sort of just the when she says, I don't want his type, I think she also means Tyrell's. Yes. I, I, I that's think true that too. I actually felt it more in our rendition of the chapter, the homophobia. I think we put more homophobia in our summary than the chapter actually had. But I do think it was there. I do think it was hinted at. I think it came across slightly more strongly in our summary than it did in the original chapter. Hmm. Yeah, it, there were lines like, the knight of flowers is not the kind of man for any boy to emulate, and I know what Loris is, I won't have him around my son. Now, yes, that especially the last one, he is Tyrell, and you don't want Tyrell influence around right. your son. So yes, it's very ambiguous what, what it, she's meaning there. But there's no question. I mean, I mean, you say those lines, there's no question. There's a homophobic element to those, for sure. It, I felt it when I was reading it. I, I felt like yeah, that that's the angle that ambiguous. she was ambiguously taking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do agree, though, with not naming a member of the Kingsguard as Master at Arms. They have other jobs. They don't need to be Master at Arms. You know, they've got... But, but I... But I also don't. I also slightly disagree with not having one of the king's guard teach the king how to fight. Right. These I are supposed to be the best fighters yeah. in the realm. You know. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's going to be standing around close by. Why not have him chime in with some help? I advice? agree. I think both could be accomplished. Yeah. And I don't think it will turn Tom and Gay. I I agree with that as well. Yeah. So, um, Kyburn's news bores and annoys Cersei, but she I notice she gives him more leeway on the news from Dawn. I guess she's when, when she hears Dawn, she's listening out for news about Marcella. Right, uh, yeah. But then she sort of, like, drifts off into a reverie about uh, when she was at Lord Estamont's uh, castle with Robert. She That's where she believes she uh, conceived Joffrey with his real father, right. Jamie. Right, who's a uh, heck of a jouster. <laughs> have give a jouster and uh well and self-servingly but also pretty fairly she did it in something of a revenge because robert was off roistering with the local ladies his while cousin she was sleeping with jimmy it's, yes well, there you are right yes no you're right yeah yeah not that two wrongs make a right but yes i it, it was yes uh, yes i mean again it's self-serving to remind yourself well he was sleeping with her but um she always gets animated by news of the small folk doing things in her honor or against her uh-huh more than almost anything else and and this is why she'll never be the leader she thinks she is right because she can't take these little slights and slurs that just don't matter exactly yeah you have to when you're the ruler of a realm you can't get you can't have thin skin and get uh, stuck down in the muck mixing it up with the small folk you know you got to rise above it you got to be a leader you got to lead by example so have you noticed that mir lis and tyrosh the news keeps coming up over and over again 
Yes, I've noticed. In fact, that's a kind of theme of this book, actually, of things coming up again and again and again. So like uh, the sparrows keep recurring in this book and the mere least Tiroshi thing keeps coming up in this book. It's it's a it, it's yes. the sort of like a long term arc to a lot of these storylines in this book, uh-huh. more so than in the earlier books, I feel. Yeah, there's this background news that is that is continually there and you just don't know is this leading to something or is he just building the world out by giving right. us news of the of the but, known but world but if it was just world building i only need to hear it once when i hear right. it in multiple chapters i'm uh-huh it's yeah. like it's like the tapestries which i th- i noticed you say funny now i've heard you say it in a different i i noticed i said it funny too i said tapestries instead of tapestries, tapestries. You... Yeah, you said it several times like tapestries. Yes, I noticed when I was editing, I was like, why am I saying it that way? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, ha- we had a comment on YouTube about uh, how how it's ironic in an, uh, a show that has a section called Pedantry Corner, how often Amory Lorch is called Armory Lorch. <laughs> oh, yeah. I is he not called Armory? I call him Armory. That's his name, right? <laughs> I said, that it's just like what I... What I call Varys, uh, Varys, and what I call Eris Ocart, Ares Ocart, yeah, or get Cersei and Sansa mixed up, or you know, sometimes when you're when you're talking fast, or at least when I'm talking fast, sometimes you know, pronunciations just get to be whatever they are, whatever comes out of my mouth. Apparently, sometimes I call tapestries tapestries. Tapestries, yes, yes. Now, now it's noticed. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I don't get why this is getting so much traction i mean it felt like it was just a backdrop to the story about quentin martell's attempt to usurp sunspear from ariane mm-hmm. ah thank you uh but it's getting so much noise i, I wonder if if it maybe ties in a little bit with the iron bank that the iron bank might have the money to pay the golden, golden company, company? to help them get their money back from King's Landing? That's, yeah, that makes sense. Because they're, uh, as the news goes, they're kind of, uh, you know. At a loose end. Yeah, they're mm-hmm. they're free players for the highest bidder. Exactly. Maybe, yep. well, maybe Stannis will take out the loan with the Iron Bank to hire the Golden Company. We'll just, uh, yeah, that could be why. Now, I'm not surprised that the dragons are continually discounted in Westeros, because that just sounds like foolishness. She says, um, it's harpies in marine, not dragons. So, she, you know, the, because of the son of a harpy. In oh, marine. she discounts the story entirely, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you mean harpies, not dragons. Uh, but so Damon Sand gets a mention in the news roundup from Kyburn. And, and, and he, he was, wasn't one of the people in the uh, no. recent Marcella chapter? Oh. He was not. He was not part of Ariane's group. Ariane did tell Eris Ocard that Damon took her maidenhead. Um, okay. And he also sent a raven to Nymeria, one of the sand snakes, telling her of Oberyn's death and the mountain's injuries. Uh, but he was he was not part of that group. But there was mention of someone that was part of that group. It was a little bit, little bit sly how it was referenced. It was the the girl. Yes, the spotted, girl Silva. Spotted, spotted Silva. Spotted Silva Santagar. Spotted Silva. Yes. Yes. So we and, get our first. And you news told of me in spoiler what was going to happen to her. That I she did. was going to go <laughs> off and marry elderly Lord Estemont. Yes. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, she was sent immediately to Greenstone. Cersei thinks it was probably. Um, a a pregnancy and right. they you know wanted to marry her off uh but uh she doesn't know of spotted silva's role in marcella's plot so right. if she did she might have a bigger reaction to this news yeah but but then it's still hard to know what that reaction should be because that could be a reward for being the traitor to that cause or it could be the punishment for being part of that cause it's very right. difficult to know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for spotted silver it doesn't sound great it doesn't it doesn't sound there great. are worse things could happen and speaking of worse things that could happen <laughs> <laughs> that's a good segue <laughs> poor Snell. so so kyburn wants subjects for whatever 
from the mm-hmm. puppeteers that have this uh, treasonous show. And Cersei says, well, I already gave you Sinel. And he says, well, the poor Remind girl is Sinel exhausted. Was? Sinel was her handmaid. And Tana Merriweather told Cersei that uh, Sinel was spying for Marjorie. Spying. And so yes. she gave, Cersei gave Sinel to Kyburn. Uh, and even Cersei shudders at the thought of what yeah. uh, Sinel's fate must be, must have been. But, you know, the thing is, is there was no evidence that Tiana was telling the truth, you know? I, Cersei didn't, to my knowledge, do much digging to see whether Sinel actually was spying for uh, for Marjorie. Possibly they wanted to put a plant in Sinel's place. So, right. the, so they got rid of Sinel, who was a loyal, <laughs> faithful servant. Exactly. <laughs> Somebody in here is fighting for Marjorie. Get rid of Sunel. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they won't be interrupted. When she's disturbed in the bath, Jamie accuses her of being drunk or stupid. I do think there's a little bit of her drinking quite a bit going on. It's sort of like it's ramped up occasionally in this book that she drinks quite a bit. And that's not great when you're trying to do these complicated machinations that she seems hell bent on orchestrating yeah uh, he certainly wasn't pulling any punches there i'm not quite sure what it was in reference to is it not allowing loris to train tommen because he's a great jouster or just the general misrule thus far i'll say this at least i have one thing in common with jamie and that's struggling to keep up with all of cersei's plots and schemes (laughs) so maybe that's what he means because you know he says that that same thing so maybe he's he can't tell whether she's got these drunken schemes or if they're just stupid schemes i i also i thought it was more to do with the sort of like keeping keeping on preventing tom from doing what he wants to do in order to maintain her rule that that was going to backfire on her the more right. she she needs to exactly what you said give him what he wants and then he'll be content and he won't bother her. Yeah. Right. That yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. But she wants to rid herself of Jamie. She she says he's more hindrance than help. So th- yeah. he, she just got him back, you know. And now she's tired of him and it's because he's yeah. not a yes man that she yeah. like the people she's become accustomed to surrounding herself but, with. But then she gets into a sort of like a sort of like a reverie about how unfair it is to be a female leader that as a female leader she's balked at every turn by the likes of jamie whereas right. robert was you know what she calls a witless lout but nobody ever said no to him right yeah and she's definitely got a point but she isn't the queen and she does have a point i'm sure but also anyone with sense enough to not just go along with whatever she says might have thoughts like that's a really bad idea have well, you thought true. about the consequences of that plan that you're considering there yeah so you and know it, it feels like robert also abdicated that kind of decision yes. she's trying to make those decisions yes if, if robert's witless stupidity was leading to well i mean we saw it ourselves when he wanted uh, daenerys murdered right he had a hand of the king who would stand up to him. And before that hand of the king, he had another hand of the king who stood up to him as well. Yep, yep. They both so. misused their power. The difference is one let the uh, let others more capable run the kingdom. Right. And one uses the crown like it's her own bank account to settle personal vendettas and act vanity projects and ignore the counsel of anyone that disagrees with her. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, neither are are going to land on the Mount Rushmore of top Westerosi leaders. Yeah, um, I think Felice Stokeworth and Balm and Birch. Um, anyone can assassinate someone. Anyone could murder someone. You know, but they are not going to dispatch Bronn. They're just not. <laughs> they are drunken oafs, and he is a seasoned fighter. It's just not going to happen. And he's smarter than than people realize exactly he is i mean he not only is a good fighter he's a calculating fighter he knows when the fight is coming which to when to fight and when to flee he's yeah and here's an example of what i was just saying using the crown like a personal vending machine this whole scheme is simply to remove a Tyrion loyalist 
Now, there's a good deal of growing paranoia about Tyrion still alive in her, thinking that Tyrion is still alive and in contact with Bronn. But you are running a realm. Yeah. You got to focus on the bigger items than this this situation here. Yep. And, 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 and some of that is the naming of the baby. I mean... Yes, right. It, it, if Bronn had named the baby John, she <laughs> might have forgotten Bronn's relationship. Uh, with absolutely, uh, yes. That is very possible, yes. I think it just reminded her that he is out there and that he was a Tyrion loyalist. Yeah. Why did Giles Rosby's ward not give them succor? Yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a weird but noteworthy detail yeah I mean, giles I, it stood out confirmed. to me but i was like i can't think why this would be i don't i don't know who giles rosby's ward is well he's not yeah i i believe they say he so we assume it's a, a that the right the ward is a boy or man of some age um but we don't they they never say who the the boy is now we know that lord giles is infirmed and has no heir so this ward could become a player if uh, uh, yeah. Giles Rosby were to die. I will say this. We'll discuss it more in spoilers. But Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and Tommen gets three kittens. And Cersei kind of wishes that they were not black kittens because black cats bring ill luck, she thinks. And that reminds her of Rhaegar's daughter. What she's thinking of is that little Rhaenys Targaryen was found under her bed and dragged out by Amory Lorch. Oh, yeah, Amory. Uh, Amory's brother. <laughs> yes, that's right. And stabbed to death. And uh, the reason why the black cat makes her think of a uh, little Rainies is that she had a little black kitten named Balerion. And many believe that that little kitten is the current mean black tomcat that stalks around uh, the red keep that Arya tried to catch. I remembered that, weirdly. All right, good. All right, so um, now it's just time for some spoilers. Uh, join us at one of the higher tiers of the Buy Me a Coffee sustainer levels, and you can get the next section. All right, well, that's excellent spoilery. Um, now, how about some background? Which All apparently right. uh, Jenny of Old Stones is a fan of. Okay, yes. N- not right. pedantry. So no. she likes your stuff, not mine, basically. That's what I'm hearing. That can't be right, because she loves comparison with the TV show as well. She did it last oh, week. Oh, she does. Yeah, she did a good job of it, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, we, we build a rich tapestry. <laughs> rich tapestry, that's right. <laughs> uh, uh, we just need a picture of Armory Lorch in our tapestry. <laughs> <laughs> So when Sir Balman apologizes for Bronn naming Lolly's baby Tyrion, Cersei says that it was a king's name before the dragons came. So here's what I can tell you about King Tyrion Lannister. Well, as best I can tell, there were three King Tyrions in the Lannister family tree, and I know absolutely nothing about the first King Tyrion. I only know that he exists because the first mention of a king by that name was King Tyrion the second. Exactly. <laughs> and of him, I know very little, but I do know that he existed. Like other Lannister kings, he titled himself King of the Rock. I don't know when he lived, but it seemed that he wasn't a very great guy. His nickname was Tyrion the Tormentor. Hmm. He earned such a moniker because despite being known as a mighty warrior and deadly with his battle axe, he was best known for his enjoyment gained from torturing people. Beyond that, it was rumored that he didn't desire a woman until he'd made her bleed first. Mm. So, not a very uh, quality no. individual. No. Sort of sort of the Kyburn of the Lannister family tree. Yeah, yeah. An unknown amount of time later, well, unknown to me anyway, a third Tyrion was King of the Rock. This guy seemed far less deplorable. In fact... He's been called the Sage King by some. Mm -hmm. I know he lived during the time of the Andal invasion because his big accomplishment that has stood the test of time was to arrange marriages between the Andals and the daughters of Western great houses. His sageness didn't end there, though, as he had seen how the Andals had betrayed the Vale Lords previously. So King Tyrion also took the Andal chief's children as wards and squires and such, 
making them hostages as well. All right. He he sounds like the true ancestor of our Tyrion. Yeah, that's right. Smart. Yeah, that guy. Exactly. Smart guy. Uh, in comparison with the television show, uh, Bronn's story had departed pretty wildly at this point, although if rumours around uh, Heedy and Flynn uh, were to be believed, she might have wanted him dead. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd... I'd missed another deviation that probably should have gone in the previous Cersei chapter, but an, an ornate viper was delivered with Marcella's favourite locket hanging from its fangs. Oh. Jaime promised to deal with it. Okay. And Mace Tyrell, I've mentioned before, wasn't shipped off to uh, Storm's End. Uh, he provides the news of the Iron Bank calling in its debts, and Cersei sends him to Bravos to deal oh. with the Iron Bank. That's okay. how he's got out of King's Landing. So All right. The rest of this doesn't really happen. Okay, good stuff. Pedantry Corner. I didn't see anything this time. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was tight. Yep, me too. I got nothing. Long but tight. Long but tight. News and notes. News and notes. Um, so actually, you might be able to help me out here because it sounds based on you commenting on the episode, it I sounds did like episode, you yes. listened through YouTube. So yeah. what has happened? I mentioned it last week. Is YouTube and YouTube music episodes are now pulling in from our RSS feed from our, from our host, Buzzsprout, rather than me having to manually create them and upload them, which is okay. huge for me personally. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've stopped manually adding episodes, but I did notice all the episodes are there. I've published them all out there. Um, if you have trouble finding them, uh, look under playlists or podcasts on our um youtube channel uh it's the okay. it's the podcaster playlist that has at the moment 259 episodes i'm sure that will obviously grow as we continue yeah, yeah, yeah. going but uh the old ones are still there for now I'll, maybe i'll take them down when i feel comfortable that the new everything's going all right with the new ones but you so, did you have any issues how did you find yeah it? so i don't i don't always listen on youtube so i don't know if it was particularly different or it sounded fine and everything However, I did notice that the ads were in there. Yes. And I don't, because it's pulling the RSS feed, which has the ads in it. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, it sounded fine. It sounded good. It worked. And you were able to access them quickly, the I, episode. Was it I an mean, issue? I was looking for episode 249. I found it immediately and I listened okay, to good. it. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. You could tell the ones that are pulled in from the RSS because they have bars on the left and right of our raven okay. sigil rather than filling the whole screen so wait was 249 in both formats no i stopped after last you week. stopped right i wanted right, to right, see right. what would happen if i didn't yeah, post one no i found it straight away i didn't find it I, I wasn't looking for a list i just went i searched for ghost of harrenhal immediately found 249 and listened perfect to it, and it was that's, cool that's what i was hoping would happen and we have an old, new, buy me a coffee sustainer. Okay, I'm confused. What do we mean? Yeah, I got to explain, right? I know. <laughs> well, Mark was a, a member of our Hedge Knight tier, and Mark has moved to our small council tier. So we oh, will be nice. interacting much more with Mark in the uh, in the future. So, Well, thank you, Mark. That's really kind of you. We greatly appreciate it. Looking forward to hanging out with you. Yes, looking forward to uh, hopefully you'll make some of our sustainer calls and maybe you'll want to contribute with a summary or something. And hopefully oh. you at least enjoy our spoilers because uh, we have fun with those. Yeah, we do. And a quick shout out to Les on the uh, Discord server for mentioning soccer. I missed that game completely, but Liverpool beat Manchester United, so yay! <laughs> <laughs> So we got a review from Drew Dreaming of the Winds of Winter in Apple Podcasts Canada. Um, the best podcast in A Song of Ice and Fire history. Take that. <laughs> That's great. I love I don't it. I need to read the rest. <laughs> That's right. We'll uh, stop right there. <laughs> I normally listen to this podcast on Spotify, but I had to download Apple Podcasts so I could leave you guys a review. You deserve it more than anything, as you are like my title said the best ever i've tried a few in the past and just couldn't get into them but you guys have made me hooked since day one i started listening in 2023 and i'm almost caught up oh sorry for that um you make any tedious task and enjoyment and perhaps the only content i have ever consumed that i enjoy hearing the banter outside of the subject material as much as the material itself keep up the great work you've been keeping me entertained in anticipation for winds of winter and my gosh has it been a lot of anticipation <laughs> you are the best and deserve all the credit i couldn't recommend you more and i hope you keep it coming even if winds of winter 
winter isn't out before you finish. <laughs> Drew, thank you so much. That's incredibly kind of you to say. Even yes. I don't think we're that good. <laughs> thank you so much. That was a, an amazing review. And it came right on the heels of a, of a three-star review we got right before that that said, no one wants to listen to you talk about yourselves. <laughs> so, well, so you've come you, to the Drew. wrong podcast, my friend. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you notice we don't read three-star reviews out. Only <laughs> worthy ones like Drew here. <laughs> well, thank you, Drew. That really is awesome. That is. Thank you. Let's conclude this one before this episode gets as long as the last one. Yeah, we're we're not too far off. We're right on it. So Cersei is certainly bubbling some plots on the fire, but they're all a little bit risky. She's, I would be lo- using a long spoon with some of her plots because some of them, I think the Marjorie one is dangerous and could come back on her. I think the Bronn one is stupid and could come back on her. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think and the I think... Iron Bank one is terrifying. Right. There's, like I said, she uses the crown like a vending machine. You know, like. Whatever she, whatever will suit her best is what she's, the the actions that she's taking and not what's best for the realm, what suits her best. And, and that's just going to be problematic in the long run, regardless. Yeah. And, and the attention she pays to things like the puppet show is so incommensurate with like the sparrows. The sparrows may turn out to be nothing, but if the merchants of King's Landing are complaining about them, you should be listening to that, not listening right. to the puppet show ended badly for the Lannisters. Yes, and that's exactly what I meant when I said she's running a realm. She has bigger things to focus on than puppeteers and little baby names, names of little babies and their stepfathers. Yes, the sparrows are crowding the city. They're being disruptive. The Merchant's Guild is saying they're a problem, and Cersei's like, oh, maybe I'll have to deal with them. But right now I have to go pull off all these plots and schemes that fit fit my personal agenda that I have. And and she's mishandling Tommen and Marjorie. She needs to, instead of stopping everything they want, she's got to give them, drip feed them what they want a little bit. Yes. Like you said, Tommen comes to two small council meetings. He's not coming back for the third one. Right. He's going to be bored. Just exactly. let him sit in. And if he's disruptive, then tell him, all right, Tommen, you look tired. Now it's time for you to leave. You know, you can come right. to one next week or whenever they, however often they have him. Yes, yeah. she's she's got to give a little bit here, and she's not giving him any of the things. So, well, who who have we got next next time, McKelly? Uh we are going to catch up with Brienne and uh, Brienne see what's Tarth. happened. Yes, yeah, since uh. she last uh, we saw her, she was um, having her first kills. Unfortunately, oh, that's right. Yeah. But there's three ways that you can help us. You could leave us a positive review, as Drew did. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall. There you can join us at any of the various sustainer levels. There's a tier to match your budget and interest, and the upper tiers get you the spoiler talk. Or you can make a donation directly to our cause at ghostsofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up on the latest Ghosts of Harrenhall news and developments, well... One, you can send us a text message these days. So please keep in mind we cannot respond back to you. But you can also check us out on our social medias. You can follow us on Twitter, at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.